Oh. Okay. Uh, well, good afternoon. Welcome to the workshop program of Kiskit Fall Fest. In this occasion, I'm proud to introduce Dr. Sarah Melly, who is second year master student at the Institute for Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo. Uh, her, her graduate studies focuses on quantum error correction and photo and quantum computing. In her undergraduate research, she studied families of t 4 t circuits uh, from a number of theoretic perspectives. Beyond that, she is interested in quantum circuits synthesis and optimization. Uh, the talk that Dr. Sarah, Dr. Sarah Mendy has to perform is a beginner's guide for quantum error correction. Uh, I remind uh, those present that due to the scheduled itinerary, we have a window of one hour. Um, Dr. Sarah has indicated the possibility to make questions during the presentation. Uh, at any way, there will be a session for questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, Dr. Sarah, the time is yours. Thank you. Well, firstly, I'm not a doctor yet. I want to work towards a doctoral degree, but thanks very much for the kind introduction. Um, so hi, everyone. Just from a brief conversation with um, Alberto, I understand that everyone is from a, a diverse background, and some of you may be even more advanced uh, than me in classical computing. So the goal that we're here today is to give you a beginner's guide to quantum error correction to demystify the hardness of this problem and to show you that, you know, even without a very rich experience in quantum computing, you can still understand how do you communicate or correctly deliver a message when in the presence of noise. And I'll, by, by noise, I'll talk more about it in the quantum sense. Okay, so you may wonder, okay, like, now we have access to 128 bits in a classical computer, why it is so hard for us to get an increasing number of quantum bits, or in other words, qubits, right? Like why couldn't we just stack multiple circuits together on one board so we can have more qubits to play with? This means we have more memory storage, we can have more computing power. Well, that all goes down to the problem that we have, that is quantum decoherence. So quantum decoherence, by definition, is the loss of quantum coherence. And what is quantum coherence? This means that we have some information that is encoded in our entangled state. Or, for example, the superposition that you were introduced in the previous uh, workshop. But because of interactions between the, our quantum bits and the environment, our quantum states are incredibly fragile. They are very easy to lose the coherence to the environment, and our information that is stored in this qubit corrupt. I'll think of it as if you have a starting point. Okay, you feed your your input into your quantum algorithm. For example, the Schwarz algorithm is doing amazing thing done in a very short period of time, but because your input, your initial input was already corrupted, there is no way for you to know like what's going on you know, in the computational process, whether your output is reliable or not, or even the most basic, what error has happened. So when there is error, when there is quantum decoherence, it makes the entire process of quantum computation unreliable. So this means that we can no longer trust the output and we can no longer use the power of quantum computation. So this motivates us to figure out a way that can effectively detect the error in a quantum system knowing what kind of error has happened and how to correct it. So on the left, you can see is a, is a picture that is drawn by uh, Dr. Daniel Gottesman. So he is one of the father of this stabilizer formalism that is prevalent in quantum, uh, quantum error correction and quantum computing. So he proposed this idea of correcting er errors using some very rigorous mathematical notation. And this picture was, draw was drawn when he was giving like one of the very um, influential talk at Fermeter Institute about uh, eight years ago. Okay, so let's start and let's think of what we can do, okay? Like naively speaking, what we would like. Well, we can either construct a fully operational quantum computer and then we use the quantum error correction, meaning that we detect the error and we correct it, right? To 
to uh, fight against the quantum noises. Um, in order to do this, we need to understand the environmental decoherence processes. For example, what caused the decoherence? What is the error? How can we model them? What are their characteristics? What are their weight? Right? And based upon this knowledge, we can better devise our error correcting model or our error correcting procedures. But for today, in this session, we're going to focus on the first bullet point, that is to construct a fully operational computer with quantum error correction. And in, uh, later on, I'll just use QECC as an abbreviation for quantum error correction. And now let's think of the quantum errors. How can we model it? Or how can we better understand these abstract ideas? Well, in quantum computing, we use something called channel to model our errors. So if you look at this notation row here, this row is something known as a density matrix. So it is a generalized representation of the state of a quantum system. So it's even more general than the unitary matrix that you learned in the previous session. But uh, please don't worry about it. This is not our focus today. But you, you, you probably want to understand the take home message is when you have an error and in the quantum system, you can use such construction, or in other words, you can use a bunch of product between operators to model this error process. So for example, here, if you look at this defacing channel, it means that some Z error is happening to your quantum state with some probability. And how do we model that? Well, we have this P to denote the probability an error would happen. Now, we use Z to denote a phase error. Now, when a phase error happens, its action on a state of a quantum system is Z rho Z. And here we use the between this and this. This is matrix multiplication. OK. And of course, we know that probability is ranging between 0 and 1, right? And this is, this is P is the error of that, well, the probability for error that happened. And 1, one minus P is the probability that the error does not happen. And now you may wonder, is this, that's it, right? Like, do we only have one error model or we have more error models? Well, the fact is we have a variety of number of error models. And this itself is uh, of research interest because people would like to better understand and better characterize our quantum errors to come up with a better protocol to defeat them or to fight against them. But for today's workshop, we're going to look at the first or the most simplest, or like the, the what we know as the binary symmetric channel, which is just an error that flip your qubits. But it will flip the qubits with some probability. So think of it as with probability p, you will flip your bit from 0 to 1 or from 1 to 0. And with probability 1 minus p, you will not flip it. Okay. So this is actually the same as what you would do in the classical computing. So now you may see like where we are going right now. We are first going to introduce you to how error correction is done in a classical system, meaning that you only have an X error, like a bit flip error. And then we'll generalize it to a quantum system. You'll see how to correct any single qubit error using this quantum analog of a classical error correction. Now, before we move forward, do, do you have any questions? Uh, We're all not good. at this moment. No, at this okay. moment, you can continue. Great. All right. So now think of this as you have two parties, Alice and Bob. So Alice has some messages she would like to deliver to Bob. But unfortunately, the channel that this message is going through is noisy, meaning that there will some interruption and it will corrupt the data. So what Alice can do is that they could either get a better communication channel, right, to reduce the error rate to get a smaller P, or she can use the quantum error correction, meaning that, okay, like Alice can first duplicate her data, okay? So let's say instead of having one bit, he used, she used three bits. And using this encoded data, this three bits data, she would send them through the channel, okay? So although there will be error happening, but on Bob's side, he can, do, he, he can do the majority count of the bit that he receives. And based upon that, he'll know roughly you know, 
what kinds of error has happened. For example, maybe the error happens on the first bit or the second bit or the third bit, and then you can perform the corresponding error correction. And I'll tell you later why this is correct and how does this work. Okay. So what is a three-bit repetition code? Now let me ask you a question and you can just answer me through the chat. If you are talking to someone, let's say um, your friend across a very noisy room, and you want to say to her, do you like ice cream? Okay, you're serving dinner, it's very noisy. But because th there are too many interruptions across the room, you cannot deliver this message. Now, what would you do to let Alice know that you wonder whether she like wh what, what kinds of ice cream she would like? Suppose that you cannot change your distance. Send him a written note, right? And what if you cannot send him a written note? What if you just you can only yell at her? Um, sorry, one more time, please. Yeah. So, um, if you are trying to communicate with your friend across the room, and you're trying to ask her what kind of ice cream does she like. But it's too noisy. Like you try one time, it didn't work out. But now you don't have access to a writing pad. You don't have access to um, like a signal or anything. Like you can only just kind of reinforce your communication to her. What would you do? Like by try by trying oh. to in order to communicate with your friend across a noisy room. Uh, I'm sorry. Maybe resend the message or use uh, uh, a new a new medium yeah exactly you will you will try again right you'll repeat the message a lot of times so by repeating the message what you are actually doing is you're distributing the message that was initially in one bit or one qubit into many qubits right because it's almost like you are fighting against this noise probability and by distributing your message you're kind of mitigating the errors so this is the same idea when you're talking about um, classical error correction so think of it as when you have a zero or one as your bit that you would like to deliver to the other side so what you can do is you can duplicate it by just do from b to bbb B. so now you have you can have zero to three zeros and one to three ones then when you receive when bob received this bit okay and for those of you from cryptography you probably know that this is called ciphertext right ciphertext. so this is the encoded messages so once you receive the ciphertext then bob would decode it okay by decode we meant doing some protocols to go from ciphertext to the message that we are sending so now i would like to introduce you to an intuitive model for this quantum error correction or in general this error correction process so let's say this is one bit okay this is one bit that you would like to send and now what you have is actually an encoder okay so this encoder will send your message to a ciphertext. Or in other words, your message will be encoded and with some help of some additional bits, okay? And this is what we meant by the duplicacy you saw earlier. And now, after this encoding thing, you will have ciphertext that unfortunately will go through an error channel. What is an error channel? It is a model that describes what kind of errors you're encountering, right? So this is, let's say, epsilon. Now, after this epsilon, your error, the error happens on some bits. You don't really know what it is, but basically information going out of here is not correct. So what you do is a error recovery process. Okay. And believe me, this is not as simple as it sounds, but this gives you a general idea of how does the process work. So this recovery process will tell you what kind of error has happened, where do they happen, 
And based upon this information, you can correct the error. So after the correcting process, the message coming out of here should be the correct message or the correct ciphertext. Okay? Which should be ideally, which should be the same as here. But what Bob received maybe is not what Alice intended to send, right? Okay, let me write out. This is Alice and this is Bob. So Bob had to do the decoding of the message. so that he can recover the message being sent and some other bit that is not really important. They are just like some helper, right? Maybe you learned about it in a previous workshop. It is called ancillary qubits or an ancillary bits, okay? So now let's use E as an encoder and D as a decoder. And this is its R. So this is how it works. So today I will show you how this encoder is working, okay? And when an error happens, based on the encoder, how do you discover and correct the errors? And finally, how do you decode them? Um, are we good? Do you have any questions about the general idea? Mm, no, 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 that's this moment. Please continue. OK, good. Now, let's think of it as doing a majority count for Bob to discover whether an error has happened. And then I'll tell you why we can do that, OK? so. Let's assume that there is precisely one bit flip error happen. Now let's do a recap. What do we mean by a bit flip error? It means that we're sending zero to one and one to zero, right? Or for those of you from mathematics, you're just kind of changing the parity of your bit from even to odd, from odd to even. So now when a one bit error happens on this duplicacy, all three zeros, it's either flipping the first bit or the second bit or the third bit. So as you can see here, or if it's happening on this other encoded state one one one, then you will have the same uh, like the same analysis, but give you a different, uh, like corrupted code, right? So you see that here, what has been changed? Like what is fundamentally different? That's the parity, right? Because if you look at previous encoded state so this is our encoded state okay. by state we just meant the status of our system you see that all the parities are the same right either all zeros or all ones but now as soon as a single bit flip bit flip error happen then they're no longer the same right you can see such discrepancy and now what if you do a majority count? What do we mean by majority count? It's by counting the occurrences of ones and zeros in your encoded state. Now, what is the what is the number of ones uh, happening in one zero zero? How many ones do we have here? Um, we are waiting for answers. Uh huh. Mm, no. Uh, so for one zero zero. Three, two, 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 repeat, two repetitions, maybe. Exactly. So we have two zeros and one one, right? And then what about in zero one zero? Uh, it's the same. It's the same. So we have one one two zeros, the same one one two zero. Now we can also do the same analysis for one one one. So I'm not going to reiterate here. But what you can see is the majority count will give us the dominating numbers in this occurrence table. Since one occurs more time, we'll take one, uh, zero, uh, sorry, since zero occurs more time, so we'll take zeros for each situation. Now, because we, we know that zero happens more time, so we still think of this corrupted data as zero, zero, zero. And, you may wonder, okay, but why, right? Like, how do you know um, one bit error is more likely than uh, like three bits error or two bits error? I'll justify that later. But for now, do you agree with me that this, based on the majority count protocol, that is, we count the occurrences of one and we count the occurrences of zeros, dependent upon which one's occurrence is dominating 
the final count, we'll take that one as our final outcome. So because zero is oh, because zero is dominating the count here, so we we think of this this corrupted corrupted state still at zero zero zero. Does that make sense? Mm. Any questions? Yes, um, I'm waiting for questions. No, or the, it makes some sense. I'm making a questions. Uh, why three? Three repetitions. Why not five repetitions or four repetitions? Ah, let me ask you this question: If you are yelling at the other guy on the other side of the room, it's it takes energy to yell, right? Like you want to make your yelling as fewer as possible, right? This mm -hmm. is like our our nature. Like we we want to kind of minimize the effort that we make to establish a correct communication. So if three bits is the minimum number that we can use, or if yelling at your friend three times is the minimum number that we can guarantee a communication, we'll do that. But if you, of course, you can do it with three, with five bits. That's totally like, there are a lot of examples in quantum error correction that is using a five bit to encode one bit. That's totally feasible. But just from the, um, from the perspective of efficiency, um, trying to make the communication easier and the cost, you know, trying to save the cost, you always want to make as few number of repetition as possible, which okay. gives you fewer number of bits. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, we have a, a question, maybe it's the same. Mariano Ulia asks, uh, how, uh, how to know the sufficient number of repetitions? Uh, maybe, maybe you have answered. It, but if you want to answer one more time yes so that's a very good question mm -hmm. it's actually not trivial like to prove that you have sufficient number of uh, repetitions you need to show that your code is capable of correcting any possible errors that is happening in the system so this is by the nature of the code design your protocols you know how do you detect errors etc um but actually for now uh, we have a lot of really good code. For example, the Steam code using seven qubits to correct, uh, to protect one logical qubit against a lot of noises. And I think this is by far the best we can get. So this is itself a research problem, and um, it demands a lot of like mathematical reasoning about your protocols. Does that help? Mm. Uh, waiting. Okay. Uh, yes. All right. So you probably have received the cheat sheet for you guys before the uh, session, and you can see the same thing on your cheat sheet. So let's go over this really quickly, so I can give you a big picture of what errors we're looking at. Now we already done the bit flip error. This is good. Okay. Now the face flip error is literally just a ZAT gate. And recall what is a ZAT gate? ZAT gate is a two by two matrix, right? And then when it acts on the zero state, which is the first column, as you can see here, right? It is just one zero it has changed. But it acts on the one bit here. If you look at the second column, you'll see that you you actually change the face. So that's why this is called a face flip error, right? You're kind of changing your face. Now you can also see that y is a composition of x and z up to some scalar and by scalar here we meant a complex unit then it will also have some um, kind of consequence right when it acts on zero and one it also changed the state but because y is a composition of an x, an x and z gate if we know how to correct an x error and how to correct a z error then we can correct a y error right and recall earlier we just talked about what is a classical repetition code so after this slide, I'll show you what is a quantum analog to correct a bit flip error, and you'll use that idea to re, uh, to correct a Z error. And now, once you have the X error correction and Z error correction, you can have the Y error correction. Okay. And the complete defacing channel is something that you saw earlier. You know, it is like a Z error would happen with some probability, and the probability here is one half. And what is a rotation error? Basically, think of the rotation error is like it's going to change your state, your state on the block sphere to some other state on the block sphere. 
And this can also be, this problem, like correcting a rotation error, can also be reduced to a problem of correcting an X error, a Y error, and a Z error. And moreover, what are this error? So here is the definition. A single qubit Pauli error is one of this single qubit error, either an X error, which is this thing, right? It's just like change from 0 to 1, 1 to 0, or a face error, keeping 0 unchanged, but flipping the face or like changing the face of 1, or it's a comp comp composition of an X error and a Z error like this, okay? So um, at the end of this workshop, I'll tell you like why we can use our Pauli error correction to correct any single qubit errors. Now, before moving forward, do we have any questions? Uh, waiting for questions. Uh, no questions. Okay. All right. So, well, what is preventing us from the quantum error correction by, you know, like why it is so hard, right? Why we cannot just think of it as a, like a more complicated version of a classical error correction. Uh, correction. That is because, well, firstly, in physics, there's a no cloning theorem, meaning that we cannot just copy any states by applying this duplicacy idea that we just introduced to you a few slides before. Um, moreover, you probably learned from a previous workshop that in quantum computing, measurement will corrupt your state, right? It's yeah. like previously, maybe your state is in a superposition, but as soon as you ask a state a question, then this superposition or this entanglement is lost. Now you will have a corrupted state. So even though you can use the measurement to see what's going on, but this procedure is irreversible. You cannot recover the previous state. So this doesn't work out. And also, in quantum error correction, you have more difficult and complicated situation to, to care about. Previously, in classical uh, situation, we only have bit flip, right? Either 0 to 1 or 1 to 0. But now you have to consider the phase flip error, the rotation error, and even more complicated the multi-qubit errors. And lastly, it's like, you know, we, we, we actually told you a little bit at the beginning of this session that um, quantum errors is not as complicated as just one gate, right? It can be modeled as a channel that has more complicated expansion and you, you want to like deal with that once you understand the basic quantum error correction. So based upon the difficulty to realize the quantum error correction, mm -hmm. the bullet point one, the difficulty to detect the quantum state, bullet point two, and the variety of quantum errors that would happen, which is bullet point three and four, quantum error correction is hard. And that, that's why we are, we are here today and learning about it. So, um, and, and lastly, we are not talking about the multi-qubit error correction today, but um, I'll tell you a little bit about it at the end of the workshop about how to generalize it. Okay, so now let's go back to the bit flip error in the quantum system. So let's take a look at this diagram here, okay? So can anyone tell me how many qubits are we looking at in terms of the input to this system? How many qubits are there in the diagram? Within, uh, la, la doctora está preguntando cuántos qubits hay en el diagrama. No sé si... In total five, right. Five. You just count the number of wires, right? Psi, zero, 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 zero. And this psi, could anyone tell me how would you write it? Like, what's the state of this psi? like a mathematical notation. Um, processing, processing. Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Yes. So, psi is a single qubit gate. Now, based upon what you learned from the previous workshops, how would you represent psi? Like, are you using computational basis? And then if yes, how would you write it? ¿Cómo es el valor de, de, sí, del estado? Sí, el primer qubit. ¿Cómo lo pueden representar? Okay, so well, let's do it together. 
um, let's take a look at this diagram, okay? And from what we learned earlier in the previous workshop, we have alpha is uh, psi is equal to alpha zero plus beta one. Okay? So zero and one are the computational basis, and alpha and beta are the complex numbers. So what you are actually having here is you have psi that is being combined with all the other two zeros, okay, like here, this part. Let's say this is A. Now, if you expand this a bit further, you will have zero alpha zero zero and beta one zero zero, right? And now you may ask me, hey Sarah, where did the ancillary qubits, which are these two guys, go? Well, these two guys are not part of this encoding process. By encoding, I meant this. Okay, this is the encoder. And you see that these two ancillary qubits only participated after the encoder, right? Like they did not participate within the encoder. So what is participating in the encoding is alpha zero 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 and beta one zero zero. Now I may wonder, okay, now what's after the encoder? Well, let's check it out. So you have a circuit, okay? Let's say this is your phi, and what is your phi? This, okay? The entangled state. And now you have a control C naught that has control on the first qubit, target on the second qubit, and the control C naught with the other like this, right? Now, if you look at this, let's do it by the state evolution analysis. You see that at phase one, you are actually having a C, this state, okay? The state at time size one, you have C naught act on phi, right? And let me just use this C naught tensor I, okay? To make it like mathematically correct. Act on, uh, act on phi, so you have C naught act on alpha zero 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 plus beta one zero zero, right? Any questions up to this point? Uh, no, it seems to be clear. Okay, so now let's apply the definition of C naught. What is C naught? Well, let's look at the table. When C naught act on zero zero, zero one, one zero one one and what would happen so let's use this okay this is our phi let's say this is psi this is psi prime okay this is better yes okay so here one is control and two is uh target and this are all the control and this are all the target so because the control is zero, so the C naught is not fired on the second qubit, so you just get zero, zero. The control is zero, not fire, zero, one. But now for the third row right here, because the control is one, so the C naught is acting as a not gate on the target, so you'll get one, one. Now lastly, because control is one, C naught is fired, it flipped the second qubit, which is the target, so you get one, zero, okay? So now let's apply the same idea to the first two qubits in this entangled state. How do you do that? Well, let's first highlight which two qubits we're talking about. So it's these two guys and these two guys. Okay. Oops, too large. Okay. Okay. Now, could anyone tell me why we're not looking at the last qubit? Like, why we only look at the first qubit? Um, me parece que pregunta qué ocurre con el último qubit. Uh, what's the single question? Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. Uh, our computers are working with electronic bulbs. No, no, no answer. Okay. Uh, the answer from Miguel de Jesus, uh, the same that the second qubit. Um, 
I'm not sure if I I understand your uh, your answer as I thought it in my mind, but I guess you you meant because if you look at the time size here, right? The C knot is not touching the last wire, right? So there's like literally nothing happening for the third qubit. So it's an identity. Nothing is happening here. So the only to worry about the first two qubits, which are these two guys involved in this time size. Now, let's go back to this table, this C not table. And you can see that because zero, zero is being mapped to zero, zero. So you have alpha, zero, zero, zero. Data. Since one zero is being mapped to one one, you have one one zero, right? Does that make sense? So basically, the state that you have here is alpha zero 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 plus beta one one zero. Okay. Okay. Now, I want you to work on your own paper. then tell me what happens at the second time size like i'll just copy this part over Okay, now we know that the state at time size one before the second C naught is alpha zero 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 plus beta one one zero. Now what happens after you have the second C naught, which is this guy? So we can do it together. We have I tensor C naught act on the state alpha zero 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 plus beta one one zero. Now we can reason analogously as before. Ah, exactly, someone did it. So because now we only care about these two guys, so these two guys are red, they're being acted upon by the C naught, while the first qubit is unchanged because nothing act on it, right? So you'll just have alpha zero 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 since this zero zero is mapped to zero zero, but now one zero, one zero is being mapped to one one here, right? The third row, so you have beta one one one. Okay, so what does this tell us? Let me copy this encoded state, okay? By encoded state, we meant the state after your, your initial state is being acted upon by an encoder. And then let's put it here. Oops, what happened? Let, let me read it one more time. So this is the state right after here, okay? So you see that although the known cloning theorem does not like allow this just naive duplicate of your code, but by using this alignment of signal gate, you did manage to multiply or to duplicate your qubits, right? Or in other words, Initially, you have this, the psi, alpha zero plus beta one. After this encoding process, you distribute the information encoded in psi into three qubits, and you have this entangled state, alpha zero 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 plus beta one one one. Since I said that this quantum error correction for the classical, for the, this bit flip error, is just a analog for what we learned earlier. It means that now we can still perform this majority count trick to detect what error has occurred. So this leads me to my next slide. Okay, the syndrome table. So the syndrome table will map, you know, the errors happening on the state to a syndrome or to something that we can detect or we can find out through some operation. Now, you can think of syndrome as, you know, when you look, go uh, see a doctor, the doctor would ask you, oh, how you feel? Do you have fever? Do you feel sore? So this syndrome is information that allows us to know what kind of error has happened and how to uh, correct it. So 
if you look at this uh, psi and if you look at this state that Bob received, if you look at here, okay. So we have some probability based upon this, you know, like what what would happen. What does it mean? Like, like what are we actually talking here? Like, it is actually analysis from probability. Okay. So I'll tell you later what we mean here. This is deriving the syndrome. And this part is building the syndrome table. Okay. Now, let's think of it in terms of the number of errors. And let's say you either, if you have a B, okay, you either flip the, don't flip it or flip it. You will have probability P to flip it and one minus T to not flip it. So let's say if there's no error happen, then what is the probability of this happening? Given that you have three bits, okay, you, you encode alpha zero to beta plus beta one to alpha zero 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 plus beta one one one. Now, if a, if no error has happened, what is that probability? Mm. And recall, all of these errors is happening independent of each other, right? So it means that it's likely that an error would happen on the first bit or the second bit or the third bit, or here we call it qubit. So let me do an example um, to show you how to do the analysis and then we can do it together. So when there's no error happens, it means that no error on the first bit, no error on the second bit, and no error on the third bit, right? All we are doing is just by multiplying this probability three times because they are mutually independent. An event happening would not have the consequence on the, the other events happening. Now, what if there's only one error? If you look at this three bit, it could either happen here or here or here, right? Now, since there are three ways of such one bit or one qubit error happens, you'll do three. Now, because they are also independent, you can have P denote one error happens and Y minus P squared denote two places with no errors, right? So this is like one error happens. And for two, what, what do you think is the probability? Uh, um. Ah, yes, exactly. So you you'll have three choose two ways to have this two errors happen, which is three. Now, because now you have two errors happen, so you have p square and one error, one place no error, right? And lastly, this is the simplest case: is when every bit has an error, then you have p cubed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Why this is important? Because I want to tell you about this graph. Now, let's ignore you know all the analysis. I'll talk about them later. But if you observe this graph and every color corresponds to a situation, you will see that actually below 0 0.5, we will have this line and this line taking the dominance, right? Basically, all the other lines are bounded kind of below by these two lines. For example, if you look at things in this area, okay, between zero and P prime, you see that this red line is bounding everything else, right? Now, if you're looking at this area, like as I highlighted here, this yellow part, you see that the blue one is dominating every other colors, okay? What does this tell us? It means that when the error probability is small enough, okay, it's more likely to have either one error or no error. And how small we consider small, just lower than 0 0.5, okay? So this leads me to further justify why the syndrome measurement is, is, is like a feasible way to protect our system against a bit flip error, is that if you look at this probability, the one that we just calculated, you see that the first two row is either when there's no error and there's one error. And our syndrome measurement, you know, our, our majority count 
is always capable of work with this one error case or you know when there's no error just trivial so the success that we will have to correct this error is characterized by this probability by just summing up okay by summing up these two guys and the failure which means when you have two bit error happening or three bit error happening is this guy is characterized by this probability now if you plot them out on your graph you see that when you have an error rate that is below 0 0.5 the success is always dominating the failure so this gives you a probabilistic proof that by taking the majority count you can effectively protect your system against the bit foot error does that make sense to you any questions waiting no waiting for questions or answers no no okay yes brilliant okay good all right so now i kind of convince you maybe you need to look into it further but as an intuition the syndrome detection the majority counting work right when the probability is low now i want to convince you how to derive the syndrome table so let's do it together let's take a look at this encoded state and we write it as alpha zero 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 plus beta one 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 right this is what we just derived earlier okay now let's look at this recovery procedure or this syndrome derivation in two steps steps one t1 step two t2 why because t1 and t2 respectively tells you whether the first two bits are different or the second and the third bits are different okay so what do i mean now let's assume because we just show you that um you know one bit flip error is more likely than two bit flip error and three bit flip error let's assume that now there's precisely one bit flip error happen or when there or there's no error happen okay there are either these two cases now let's say if there's one bit flip error happen and it happens on the first qubit then what would happen you'll see that your 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 state will become alpha one zero zero plus beta zero one one right now it, what about the ma ma majority count you see or like what if the we look at this you know this uh pattern of the occurrences of your bit you see that the first two bits here oops this is too large the first two bit here they're different right in this superposition but the last two bits here are the same now if you look at this t1 you see that because you have one being on the control for this first c naught this guy will fire it right well let me use a better color for firing like i want to use a orange like to show that this guy is fired okay so this guy is fired and but because the second one here the second one is is zero it's not fired so let me use a cooler color let's use gray so this guy is not fired okay now this is the same as saying okay on this ancillary qubit which is this guy okay the knot act on it precisely once because this guy is fired but not this guy does that make sense to you in terms of this corresponding changes and the corresponding action of the c naught on this ancillary qubits the first one this guy does that make sense mm. waiting waiting wow okay so let's assume that you are following and let let me do another example since we're running out of time um so when the there is decrypt discrepancy between the first two qubits you will see that the first ancillary qubit will be flipped because only one c naught act on this thing right only one knot is acting but when when you look at this t2 right this is acting on the first and the third qubit right and then 
there is also discrepancy between the first qubit and the third qubit. One is one and the other one is zero, right? It means one of them will be fired. For example, this guy will be fired, but this will not. So since the first T1, the T1 will flip zero, so that it will become one, and T2 will fit the other ancillary qubit will become one. So the error syndrome that you derive would be one, one. And this is for an X1 error, meaning that an X error is happening on the first qubit, okay? And what do I mean by this guy here? This is just a measurement. And you, you, you may wonder, okay, you just told us that measurement is bad, like measurement corrupt your state. How could you still, still do that? Well, this is because we're acting on ancillary qubits, right? Ancillary qubits is some helper qubits that would not engage in the encoding of the system. So it does not carry the system information. So even though they're corrupted, it does not really like harm um, the process of um, quantum error correction. So we're good. But this, is, this gives you an example of how to derive the error syndrome from this recovery process, okay? So now, since you know that, okay, well, there's a one-bit flip error happening on the first qubit, I can just correct it by putting an X here, and then I'm done. And then I recover this encoded state at alpha 000 plus beta 111, and then we're good. And then you can put a decoder here just to recover it. So in order to show you this process, I'm going to give you this picture here. So this is the encoder. Uh, oh, this is actually, this is a more complicated version of the encoder. But basically, the encoder would be look like a, a, a reverse of this little, of this guy, this encoder, okay? So if you understand uh, math, the function, if you take an inverse of a function, you'll get identity, right? So this is the same idea. Decoder is the inverse of your encoder. So by taking the inverse of your encoder by just, you know, finding some gate, then you can just recover your mm. quantum state and you'll get this psi. Okay. All right. So this tells us, okay, once you have a bit flip error on a quantum system, you can always encode it using three qubits. And by expanding your, no your knowledge or like expanding your information across these three qubits, you can derive syndromes to allow you to detect the errors and then correct it. Now, if you look at the cheat sheet that I showed you, you have another equation called H is conjugating Z, and that gives you an X, okay? It means whenever you have a Z gate, you can always send it to an X gate by conjugating it by head market. So this gives us the recipe to, fit, to fix the flip, uh, the flip error. Why? This is because whenever you have a Z error, right, you can just put a, a wall of head gates here and a wall of head gates here, okay? So let's assume that the Z error happens here. Then by this relation, you'll get this circuit will become XII since head gate times head gate is equal to itself, okay? Head gate is self-inverse. So you reduce this problem, this, Z flip error to a uh, X bit flip error like this. Okay, so this is why it is so important to understand how does the three qubit bit flip error correction work? Because as soon as you have it, and with this identity, you can immediately reduce your error correction of Z error to an error correction of a Z uh, X error. Does that make sense? Any questions? I'm waiting for questions or answers. No, no, at this moment. Okay, um, so I think let me have five more minutes and tell you the big picture, and then we can end the day. So you may wonder, oh, Sarah, like you just told us, like we have Y error, right? Like this two thing does not give us a solution to a Y error. Well, sure, like the same sure that come up with the Shor's factoring uh, algorithm give doctor, us. Let me, doctor, yeah. let me interrupt you one moment. Uh, yeah. A question from Mariana Olia. Yeah. Uh, the second C0 uh, C should not be uh, uh, in other sense. Uh, Great 
Could you repeat? Can you please? check your synods? Can you check your synods gates? Uh, they are proposing that the synod may be may may be swapped. Oh, you meant this diagram? Do you? Yes, oh, yes. yeah, that's a very neat uh, observation. The answer is no. This is because in this diagram, I'm being lazy. I actually merge the recovery process and the decoding process into one part, which is this part. Okay. Um, actually, um, to help you better understand, I also prepped um, uh, like a, a, a complementary notes that will ask Pablo to distribute it to you after the workshop. But you can prove mathematically that this diagram is the same diagram as when you have a recovery procedure combined with the inverse of your encoder. So like this is exactly the same. The, the only difference is now you just have this psi immediately after this thing. Like, or let me let me show you more specifically what I meant. Um, so you see this diagram here, okay? So this diagram is the same idea as the diagram that you 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 pointed out that does not look right, like this one. This part, like this at the part after the error channel, is doing the error recovery and uh it's doing the correction and the decoding together in just one code block so that's why it looks a little bit weird to you but once you verify it mathematically it just works okay thanks for the question okay so sure in 1997 um uh, he came up with this enlarged circuit that instead of using three qubits to encode one logical information, you know, the one qubit you want to protect against the noises, he used nine qubits. So by doing so, he literally just combined these two figures, okay? This figure, the top one, and this figure, the bottom one, together so that this enlarged circuit with nine qubits is capable of correcting a single qubit x error, a single qubit or a single qubit z error, or a single qubit y error. And the reason you can do so is because um, I will just very briefly mention to give an idea and verify it um, at your own pace. So if you look at this part, okay, what does this remind you? This is literally the same thing as this, right? So any three qubit code block here is capable of correcting one X error, regardless of what where it happens, right? Either this wire, this wire, or this wire. Apply the same reasoning to this code block. Apply the same reasoning to this code block, okay? So this analysis tells us that this part okay let's think of it as a sandwich so this inner sandwich circled in red is capable of correcting any single qubit x error happen happening on any wire okay now what happens you have a z error okay then since the z error will not be like this this whole thing okay this red part will not affect the Z error. So this outer part, as you can see here, will first change your Z error to an X error, and then this X error will be captured by this outer side, like these two guys. This, this like five guys, and then they will be corrected. Okay, so you may wonder, well, that sounds strange. Like it's very counterintuitive. Like why you could make this work? Well, this all, all goes back to how your state is being coded. So let me just give you a really quick demo about this, okay? Let's just take a screenshot of this part. Screenshot, image. OK, 
okay and now let me make this smaller okay so what is this happening is you initially have L, um, alpha zero plus beta one and this guy is being tensored with a zeros right together and by the dis distributivity that we just learned you were you are actually having all zeros plus beta one all zeros right now think of it by every code block so you could actually think of it as well if you have a c naught acting on the first qubit and on the fourth qubit you are doing well this one is still the same but you're actually changing your beta right to one zero zero one and all zeros right Does that make sense? Because the the first wire is one, so it will fire the the the, the C naught. So it will flip your uh, flip your your qubit. Is this reasonable? Mm, yeah, this part is reasonably. Okay. Yes. And then. You can apply the same reasoning by this C naught. So this idea, okay, this analysis of this state evolution can be applied to the entire whole state, which I meant, hang on. I meant this part. Right? Recall earlier we gave you this model. You have the input, encoder, air channel, recovery decoder this is your encoder okay so you can check mathematically that after the encoder your state zero will be encoded as zero 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 plus one 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 okay tensor this whole thing again and then oops sorry this whole thing again okay so think of it as you're essentially looking at three blocks of entangled state right you have this a and this bit. now if you have a z error happening on some block right regardless whether it's in the first qubit of this block or second qubit of this block or the third qubit of this block this is that will always just change your plus to minus you'll change it to this right because it's just one one phase flip so this construction or this encoding process tells us that we are no longer worried about the actual location of a z era in one code block as i showed here this code block or this code block this code block because the encoding process is caps encapsulating or is capturing this z era so that no matter where it happens we always be corrected using this construction like this part oh sorry i should use the highlight this part this part this part and this and this right because what this is essentially doing is you're embedding two wires here in between this headmar and this headmar two wires here and two wires here which is essentially an enlarged circuit of this guy Okay, you're just like plugging two wires here, like here, like this. This. Now this is like a nine qubit. Okay, and the reason you can do so is the locality of your Z gate no longer matters because of encoded state. Okay, I'm sorry that we're running out of time. Let's wrap up. So, what we have shown you is that. We learned how to correct a single qubit bit flip error, a single qubit Z flip error, and when Y and X and Z happen to give us Y error in a first nine code, we can correct it. And moreover, because there's a very important um, uh, single qubit error thing is 
any two by two matrix which corresponds to an arrow can be expressed as linear combination of an X arrow, Y arrow, and Z arrow. So since we know how to correct this, this every one of them independently, right? We know how to correct uh, the linear combination of them. And when we have multi qubit, we just apply some um, some threshold that can prove math mathematically sound to correct the errors. And this gives us the end of our workshop. And if you're curious to find out more about quantum error correcting codes, you can check out this website. So this is uh, created by uh, Victor at Maryland University, uh, University of Maryland, and Michael Vasmir at Parameter Institute. So this is a, re a reservoir for all the quantum error correcting codes that you can find um, in literatures and in history. So it's very useful if you want to learn more about quantum error correction. And that's it. Thank you, everyone, for your attention. And if you have questions, um, you can ask me. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, this is the most basic thing for error correction in test computers, but in quantum computers, it's a, a science. OK, we. It, it's, it's time for a session for questions for, for our audience. Es tiempo de preguntas para la audiencia. Uh, do you have any questions? ¿Tienen alguna pregunta? Armando, do you have any questions? Okay. Um, for Mariano, Uria, it is possible to use this process in IBM quantum computers. Uh, are the synod gates a big problem? Yes, that's a very, this two are a very good question. But my, my answer to the first one is yes. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that when you look at the Qiskit um, compiler, there is error correction being incorporated in this process. So you can check out the, actually you can choose whether you would like to incorporate this error correction process in your compiling. And I was recently talking to um, a guy at Google, he's working at Google Quantum AI, so Google Quantum AI is using surface code as their quantum error correcting code. And they are designed hardware that work specifically with surface code. So you could see that basically every big tech uh, quantum lab is working on different trajectory, uh, trying to realize universal fault tolerant quantum computation by incorporating quantum error correction in their hardware architecture. So that's a very good question. So my uh, your, your other question um, is, whether C0 would become a big problem? The answer is yes. So let's think of it as this diagram, OK? OK, you have a C0. Now, if you have an X error here, this thing is equivalent to this. OK? And um, by, this, by this knot, I just meant a knot gate, OK? So how do you interpret this identity? It means that when you have an X error that happens on the control qubit, this error will be propagated across the C naught. So now you have two errors on one on the control and the other one is target. Okay. This means that the error existing in your system is duplicated. Now, if you have many errors, many C naughts, okay, acting on one code block, let's say you have this code block. Okay. And the code block, I meant, you know, you use many physical qubits to encode one logical information, okay? And now you have a C naught here, 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 okay? By error, like this arrow, I meant target. By this starting point, I meant control. Now, let's say you have an error here, okay, X error. Now, by this rule above, you will have an error here, you have an error here. Now you have an error here, you have an error here, you have an error, right? Like now you have five errors from zero to five. This means that when you have C naught in one code block, your errors will get propagated so that they somehow become uncontrollable. Because we called earlier, we were saying that our code is capable of correcting one error, right? A single qubit error. But now, because you have multi qubit error in one code block, your quantum error correction failed. So prop, uh, error propagation is a big issue. And this is what is called the fault tolerant concern. Okay, so if essentially, you want to have a quantum error correction code 
that has somehow this kind of tolerance to the propagation of errors, and which means that maybe you don't want to have the CNOS acting on the same code block. And another example is a Z error. So let's say if you have a Z error, okay, on the target, and you can also prove mathematically that this is the same as this. Okay, it means that when you have a Z error acting on the target, then this error will get propagated across the C naught to the control and target. So now your error get duplicated and become uncontrollable. So the answer is yes, C naught is a big issue for fault tolerant quantum computing. Other questions? Um, waiting for another question. Seeing another pregunta. Uh, while our audience is thinking about questions, uh, uh, Doctor, do you have a do you have data about the success rate of this technique? Yes, that's a very interesting question. So my answer to the one that we learned today is here. Okay, this is the success rate. This is the failing rate. When when we assume naively that there's no error propagation, when there is, maybe we need to like look into further. But when there's no error propagation with one bit error, or when there's no error, we can success with this, where p is the probability, um, the probability that one bit flip error occurs. which goes back to this binary symmetric channel that we learned at the beginning here, okay? This guy. With this, our success rate is one minus three P squared plus two P cubed. Okay, thank you. No problem. Um, uh, waiting for more questions. Well, we are, uh, okay, okay, uh, questions? We are on the time. Okay, there is another questions. How to change the application of the same procedure a different uh, computer, uh, quantum, quantum, quantum computers from different materials? Oh, for different materials, you meant superconducting quantum circuits, ion traps, like this? Yes. Uh, uh, Yes. Yeah, okay. That's a very good question because earlier we used the channel to describe our error models, right? That's actually where the underlying hardware come into place or that's where the material becomes important because let's recall that here you use this thing, map. This is a map, okay? You map a density matrix to some other density matrix and what happens in this channel, this epsilon, is by some Krauss operator, okay? Very messy, let's don't worry about it, but this is like what, what is described when there's an error model. Now, if you use, let's say, Eintracht, so in it, like I'm not a physicist, so I cannot say it with confidence, but I'm pretty sure that in Eintracht, some error is more likely and some errors is almost impossible. This means that you will have a different model, you will have a different error channel to consider. So maybe there's uh, there's a less likelihood for that error to happen. So basically, you need to design an uh, error correcting code that works very well with an X error, and you don't need to worry about the Z error. Okay, this also affects the fault tolerant concerns for the um, for the quantum error correcting codes because recall early, uh, just now we saw the oops, hang on, we saw this right. You see that in the C not gate the control is more sensitive to not error and the target is more sensitive to Z error. If you somehow know that in your error model, Z error is like less likely, it means that, you know, when you have a, uh, even when you have C naught in the same code block, but it's target, it's, it's you know, it's like this. Oh, uh, sorry, if, if, if you have something like this, okay? This is not as much of a concern than as this one, right? 
because this is if you have x error it will be propagated but if you have an x error here it will not so i think um based upon the materials you're using the hardware architecture the underlying topologies you know everything physics you will have a different discussion for the error models the quantum error correcting procedures and the fault tolerant consideration does that help okay um eso, eso responde a su pregunta, Luciana. Yes, thanks. Uh, well, we are on time. Uh, maybe Alberto uh, Maldonado uh, could be a, a message. Or... Yes, Mario, yes. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, uh, Sarah, for this. Mm -hmm. Amazing uh, didactic uh, workshop. Actually, it was very interesting how you can apply quantum error correction because, sincerely, for my side, it's a complicated yet to understand this kind of process. But actually, that is interesting in this kind of workshop, try to apply the different knowledge in a different application. So, thank you mm -hmm. so much for that and for your time. No problem. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Um... Uh, we have reached the end of this session. Uh, we thank uh, Master Sadam Lee for sharing, sharing uh, her knowledge and experience, as well as to the present for your assistant. Um, uh, and we look forward, uh, we look forward to another Quisque fault, uh, fault Fest event to see the change that we have placed since today. Uh, thank you for everyone. Uh, have a good, good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for the organization. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye. Oh, by the way, uh, Alberto, do you want me to send you the uh, the complimentary notes, uh, like the one that I mentioned? Yes. If you want, uh, let me um, add it in the, well, let me show you the Discord server. And if you want, you can share. The, yeah, sure. The notes. Yeah. And if they have another question that uh, you can try to solve? Yeah, they can ask me in Discord. <laughs> okay, sure. So then in a moment, I, I'll show you the Discord server. Thank you. No problem. Bye. Bye.